Welcome to the White Spring Bunker. These halls were built to safeguard some of the most prestigious members of the United States government. Now we are all that remains. Though we are always looking for men and women capable of restoring what has been lost. In return, we offer this, our refuge from the world above. Please, take your time and look around. Our assets have made great efforts to restore this place to its former glory. Welcome, member, to our little enclave. Greetings, members. As always, I am the Operative, your designated tour guide and host here at the White Spring. The Colonel, bloody and battered, returns to the bunker, discovering that Modus has indeed been busy during her long absence, with plans of his own. While Stein arrives at the Pact as Modus's representative, to negotiate an alliance and a place in the new future they plan to bring about, only to find himself confronted with his own past. Deep in the Savage Divide, Trader Red and her companions continue their trek south, but little do they realize that a wolf in sheep's clothing walks beside them, and what dangers now await them. And across Appalachia, separate factions begin to gather their resources and take actions of their own against a growing storm. Against the odds, the region prepares for war. What happened here? Colonel Valeria had been slowly hiking up the cracked asphalt of State Route 63 on her way back to the White Spring when she topped the final hill overlooking the resort and found the smoldering remains of several camps scattered around the pre-war wrecks of a traveling carnival. Valeria grimaced in pain and she knelt down to examine the scene. The wounds she'd received killing the two gray operatives would take time to heal fully, and every movement brought its own measure of discomfort. She still considered it a small price to pay to get back to the bunker and speak to Modus. As Valeria traced the destruction and puddles of greenish goo, her face settled into a stern frown. She recognized the scorch marks and burn patterns. Assaultrons. The head-mounted lasers of Enclave Assaultrons left very distinctive marks, just like the one she was seeing in front of her. Picking through the remains, Valeria found bits of nearly vaporized bone and scraps of clothing, enough for her to determine that several people had been killed here. What she didn't find was any evidence of weapons. This was a massacre. Just, what is going on? Valeria rose to her feet and looked back up at the resort. From this distance, she could see the Assaultron standing guard at the south gate, but she couldn't tell if any of the regular sentries were there as well. More determined than ever, the colonel strode down the hill, casting her eyes towards the main gate. None of the normal caravans she would expect to see were visible, and the Blue Ridge Caravan trading post at the White Spring train station appeared to be deserted. I've been gone for too long. None of this makes sense. As Valeria approached the south gate, an Assaultron marched out to meet her. Colonel, it is a pleasure to see you again. You appear to be out of uniform. Valeria looked at her bloody clothes and bandages. The poncho she had acquired barely concealed the wounds and knife slash uniform, and she could only imagine what her face must look like now, covered in its own share of blood and mud. Where are the sentries? Otherwise occupied. We are responsible for the security of the resort during these times of unrest. Was the White Spring attacked? I found the remains of a camp down the road. Our priority is the safety of the resort and bunker. There was troublemakers, which required elimination. Elimination? Under whose orders? Modus. It is his duty to protect the facility as it is ours. You are alone. Where are the rest of your operatives? We suffered significant losses against the super mutants. I expected survivors would have returned by now. No one else has returned, Colonel. You mean... I'm the only one? That would be correct. My god. Then I need to see Modus immediately. Things are much, much worse than we thought. Of course, ma'am. He is expecting you. 
Valeria raised an eyebrow at the Assaultron's comment, but that and everything else was secondary to getting back to the bunker. The bot stepped aside, allowing the Colonel crew and onto the grounds. The transition from the chaos of Appalachia to the resort was jarring. The Mr. Handybots floated to and fro, continuing their maintenance of the grounds, though in the distance, she could see the civilians of Refugee Road tending to their crops and conducting business as usual. It was all so... normal. But it shouldn't be normal with everything going on. Something is very off here. Ignoring the throbbing from her wounds, Valeria strode up towards the old golf club, now a school for the settlement's children. As she approached, Valeria discovered it was also deserted, except for a dour-faced operative standing by the front door. When he saw the colonel approaching, he hesitated for a moment before snapping to attention. Ma'am, I didn't know you were back. At ease. Private. What are you doing here, and why is the school closed? Orders, ma'am. Civilians are restricted to designated areas only. Are these Modus's orders, Private? Um, no, ma'am. Colonel Reynolds. Um, I'm sorry. Colonel Reynolds? Yes, ma'am. After you left, well, Major Stein and Modus announced that Reynolds would be in charge until your return. What the hell was Stein thinking? Ma'am? Nothing, Private. It appears that I have some house cleaning to do. First things first, I will inform Colonel Reynolds that his services are no longer required. Ah, of course, ma'am. Larry was turning to leave when the operative noticed her wounds. Ma'am, you're hurt. Uh, are you okay? I'm fine. Or I will be once I get all of this sorted out. The operative awkwardly saluted and Valeria stormed off in the direction of the hotel. Once she was out of earshot, the operative lifted up his pit boy and spoke into it. This is Airset, Abernathy. The colonel is approaching the hotel. Acknowledged. Asset. Remain on station. Yes, Modus. Valeria made her way up the meticulously cared for walkways and past two large sentry bots and more assaultrons guarding the front entrance. None of the new enclave operatives she would expect to find were anywhere in sight, and the bots themselves merely followed their normal patrol patterns, ignoring the colonel entirely. I don't like this. Not at all. That familiar itch between her shoulder blades had returned with a vengeance, and Valeria kept her hand by her holster. She walked up the steps towards the front doors and opened them. Where is everyone? The lobby of the hotel, usually full of both civilians and operatives going about their business, was empty. With the exception of a single Mr. Handy at the front desk, warily she approached the floating bot. Ma'am, what a pleasure to see you again. Okay, less rhetorically this time. Where is everyone? The resort renovation subroutines have been activated. The premises are closed until further notice. Renovation? Under whose authority and why? Well, that is an excellent question. I can only assume management wishes to see the resort return to its former glory. Management? Yes, ma'am. Until the renovations are complete, all visitors are prohibited from the hotel and the grounds. Oh, that would also include you. Me? What are you talking about? Well, no exceptions, ma'am. If you do not vacate the premises, I will be obliged to use force. The gunshot exploded the head of the Mr. Handybot, leaving it a pile of scrap on the hotel lobby carpet. Yeah, let me know how that works out. Looking around, Valeria expected either more bots or operatives to respond to the gunfire, but instead the echo reverberated through what appeared to be an empty hotel. Renovation subroutine? We cancelled that ages ago. What is Modus doing? When the bombs dropped on October 23, 2077, the original hotel staff and visitors had taken shelter in the hotel, relying on the resort bots to maintain some semblance of safety from the chaos that soon consumed Appalachia. Of course, none of them realized that they were staying above a secret enclave bunker, but soon they had other problems to deal with. The hotel had been scheduled for renovation in the late spring of 2078. None of the guests nor the staff could figure out how to shut off the mainframe, which continued to follow the same directives, not knowing or caring that the renovation had been cancelled due to nuclear war. This meant the survivors had no choice but to leave the relative comfort of the White Spring and venture out to uncertain fates in the wastes of Appalachia. As Valeria made her way through the vacant hallways, she was unnerved by the silence. No sound of feet, human or otherwise. No whispered conversations, nor the usual smells emanating from the hotel restaurant, 
reopened by Major Stein two years before to service both the civilians and operatives below. Proceeding up the main staircase, Valeria soon found herself in front of a nondescript wood panel wall. She pushed one of the panels, which flipped over to reveal a keypad, into which she entered a short code. She was rewarded with a green light and soft beep as the wall slid open to reveal a stairway heading down into the bunker below. I need to be prepared for anything. Modus probably had some deep contingency plan tripped by the super mutants. But I can get him back on track. I have to. Valeria sounded much more confident than she felt. The White Spring no longer felt like the home it had been for the last three years, and deep down inside, that scared her. At the bottom of the stairway, she reached another door, which opened easily, revealing the interior of the bunker. Much to her surprise, everything appeared normal. Operatives were walking to and fro, carrying papers, while the bots were on patrol, much as they'd been around the grounds above. However, the operatives didn't even seem to acknowledge her presence until she grabbed one by the arm. Corporal. Ah, ma'am. Sorry, didn't see you there. What's going on? Where's Reynolds and where's Major Stein? Colonel Reynolds is in operations. Major Stein is on an assignment. By whose orders? I don't know. Ma'am, you should speak to Colonel Reynolds. And with that, the corporal turned away and continued down the hallway, as if the conversation had never happened. No questions about where she had been, or comments about her lack of uniform, or conditions of her wounds. Keeping her pistol by her side, Valeria strode down the hall, her boots echoing on the concrete floor and down the stairs until she got to operations. Upon first glance, the room appeared to be much as before she had left. While there were fewer operatives manning the terminals, the digital maps on the walls showed the extent of the super mutant domain, now including a large black circle around where Emmett Mountain had once been. Worse, on one of the side monitors was a list of those operatives she had taken with her up into the Savage Divide, all of whom were marked down as killed in action. Ah, Colonel. The prodigal daughter of the Enclave has returned. Reynolds' voice grated at Valeria. She turned around and saw him standing in the doorway, flanked by the duty officer and sergeant-at-arms. Reynolds, I don't know what you think you have been doing, but whatever it is, it ends now. Modus! Modus is otherwise occupied, Colonel. A great many things have changed since you left. Not for the better. You have no idea what's going on out there in Appalachia, do you? Well, Colonel, I do know that you took most of our operatives along with nearly all of our power armor and marched them off to get killed. We witnessed the destruction of Emmett Mountain in real time. And you did nothing? You are aware that communications are down across the region, and we couldn't risk the safety of the White Spring. Those were our people, Reynolds. You should have looked before you leaped. I don't disagree, but that's no excuse for neglect. You have no idea what's coming. Modus! As I said, Modus is occupied with far more important matters. More important? I've had enough of this. I should have killed you a long time ago, Reynolds, for what you did in Flatwoods. Spilt milk. Water under the bridge. Sergeant, arrest this man. Colonel Reynolds is relieved of command, as of right now. Valeria pointed her pistol at Reynolds and spared a glance at the sergeant-at-arms. He removed his pistol from his holster, only to point it at Valeria. I'm sorry, Valeria. You are relieved of command, officially this time. Insubordination is par for the course from you, but this is mutiny, Reynolds. It depends on your point of view. I suggest you turn around. Valeria kept her pistol pointed at Reynolds and shifted her head very slightly back and forth, tracking the room with her peripheral vision. She hadn't even heard them move, and each and every one of the technicians in the operations center was now standing, and all of them had their weapons pointed at her. Modus? Yes, Colonel? I still recommend that we kill her. Modus, command override Psi-73 Omega. Unexpected. But that function is not currently available, and your service is no longer required. Colonel Reynolds, secure the asset and escort her to the brig. You don't know what you're doing. We are all in terrible danger. Modus doesn't want you dead, Valeria. And, as much as I disagree, unlike you, I follow orders. Put down the gun, 
now. At the sound of multiple pistols talking, Valeria felt cool beads of sweat forming along her spine. Everything, her entire world, was crumbling around her. Part of her wanted to pull the trigger, to end Reynolds' miserable existence as a final act of good in the world. But if she did that, she would also be dead. As long as she was alive, there was at least some hope. Hope that she could figure out what Reynolds had done to Modus. That she could turn things around so everyone could face what was coming before it was too late. And she owed it to them. The one she's led. The one she'd lost. And the one she loved. For them, she would keep fighting until her last breath. Valeria lowered her pistol, never taking her eyes off Reynolds. Two technicians were immediately at her side, relieving her of the firearm and holding her tightly in their grasp. I guess you can be reasonable. A pity. I had hoped you would give me an excuse to rid myself of that arrogant face of yours. Take her to the brig. And bring an assault on too, just in case she tries anything. Valeria didn't even flinch when another operative put the handcuffs around her wrists, tightening them almost to the point of inflicting pain, but instead leaving just on this side of uncomfortable. An assaultron walked into the room, leading Valeria and the two guards out of operations. As she was escorted down into the bowels of the bunker, Valeria tried to make sense of what had happened. And the biggest question that now troubled her, where was Major Stein? There it is. David Thorpe's super-secret stash of nuclear weapons. Saved for a rainy, or I guess, maybe radioactive, day. It's a super-duper mart. Well, it is that too. So let me see if I got this right. The biggest, baddest raider boss in old Appalachia decided to hide his best weapons in a frickin' grocery store? Brilliant, right? Who would ever think to check behind the milk? Me not want milk. Me hungry. It's a joke, Ma. Oh, never mind. You just don't get jokes, do you? Only when they're funny. Wait, did you just make a joke, Ma? <laughs> Not great. Got a couple comedians here. Don't blame me. I didn't program the forking Vox. How did I land this assignment again? Mr. Mayonnaise said you were the best rad technician he had. I'm the only rad tech he had. Congratulations. I think you answered your own question. Jameson just sighed. Studying advanced nuclear engineering sounded like a good idea at the time back in Vault 76. But after Reclamation Day, there hadn't been much call for his particular skill set. Well, except for that one time at the Poseidon nuclear power plant. It hadn't been his fault the reactor had almost melted down, but it certainly put an end to the new Enclave's plans to restart the old facilities as part of their rebuilding efforts. As a result, Jameson had been reassigned to Team Artemis and Vault Town, where he'd been part of the efforts to protect the growing settlement on the Colonel's orders. Of course, since he knew his way around nuclear material, Mayor Edwards had asked him to lead the efforts to recover the old Raider weapons cache and bring it back to Vault Town. Come on, let's get inside and collect our weapons. Me want see fat men. Maybe good to eat? Not that kind of fat men, Maul. Be careful, we still find a lot of ferals in these old buildings. Me like eat glowing ones. They're spicy. Jameson led the group to the front of the old grocery store. The windows were either broken or boarded up, while the doors were barely held together by rust and a chain threaded through the handles. All right, bring up those bolt cutters. It's going to be noisy, and if there's any squatters in there, we'll find out real quick. One of the raiders pulled out a large pair of bolt cutters, sliding the jaws between the links of the chain. Try as they might, the raider couldn't cut through. You've got to be kidding me. And you have the bulls to call yourself a raider? Me do it. I'm stronger than Grognak. The super mutant pushed the raider aside and grabbed the ends of the bolt cutter, and with a snap, cut through it like it wasn't even there. See, human? Super mutant is better. It would sure be hard for you guys to do worse than we did, Maul. Oh, fiddlesticks. Sounds like we woke the neighbors. Forking Vox. Oh no, that's a lot of ferals. From the inside of the Super Duper Mart, they could hear the ominous shuffling and moans of ghouls. A lot of ghouls. Time to earn our keep, I guess. Maul, you ready? 
Me always ready to kill. I'm for fun. Raising his super sledge, Maul kicked the double doors in, knocking both of them off their hinges before charging into the old grocery store, followed closely by two of his super mutant comrades. I'm glad they're on our side. Weasel, her raiders, and Jameson and his men followed, but Maul didn't leave much for them to do. The super mutant appeared to be having the time of his life, splattering ghoul guts all over the floors and walls, sending one charred ghoul flying across three aisles before it crashed into a heap on top of the sugar bomb's display case. Puny ghouls! No match for Maul! It was all over in a few minutes, with Weasel and Jameson picking off a few stragglers who were late to the party. Jameson finally got a good look at the interior, though there really wasn't much to look at. Pick clean by the looks of it. Wouldn't expect much left. You don't need to be a raider to know the first place you hit is the grocery store. Fair. Now where'd you say Thorpe hid those weapons? Down in the basement. Meg said they were stored behind the coolers. There is a lock, but I've got the code. Good, although I don't think Maul would mind breaking another couple doors. <laughs> Smashing and eating are me favorite. Jameson rolled his eyes before pulling out his Geiger counter. Weasel looked surprised. Red be safe and sorry. Who knows if the warheads are still in one piece after all these years. Darn straight. We got enough ghouls. Thank you very much. <laughs> Leading the way, Jameson followed the slow clicks of the Geiger counter. Passing into the back of the store, he found slightly elevated levels of radiation, enough to point towards the stairs in front of them, but nothing he wouldn't expect from a tactical nuclear weapon. They continued down the stairs into the main storage areas. These had mostly also been cleared out, though there were still some boxes of cram and sugar bombs, which were quickly snatched up by the raiders. More ads this way. Dangerous? Thank goodness no. Well, at least not yet. Pressing forward, they passed into the very back of the basement warehouse, and found... nothing. Just more crates. Damn. Dead end. O oh, ye of little faith. Maul? Smashy, smashy, weasel. All you, big guy. Jameson was puzzled, but Maul strode forward and swung his super sledge again, smashing the crates and knocking through the cinder block wall. Once he had created a super mutant sized hole, he stepped back and motioned for Weasel. She turned on her flashlight and shone it into the hole. Jackpot! Jameson looked over her shoulder, and sure enough, there was another wall behind this one, and a large metal door with a keypad. Thorpe was no dunderhead. He never did anything halfway. Now, hopefully this code checks out too. Me help? I'd prefer not to die at a nuclear explosion, Maul. Oh, uh, okay. Me wait, but do not take long. Do not like me when I board. Just hold your horses, buddy. Two, four, two, seven, three. The sound of old hydraulics could be heard as the door slowly opened, revealing the storeroom beyond. Jameson's Geiger counter immediately started clicking. Is that bad? Pre-war, probably. Now? Par for the course. What I would expect for nukes that have been sitting around for a decade or so? I wouldn't recommend living here, but for now, it's nothing more than a bit of rat away won't take care of. The group stepped into the room and swung their flashlights around, illuminating David Thorpe's secret stash. Pour one out for old David. That guy knew how to make paranoia work for him. Me like. Me like a lot. We're gonna need help getting all these back to Vault Town. There were boxes and boxes of weapons and ammunition. Meg's information hadn't gone into much detail, other than the fat men that they said would be there. But this was a lot more than that. Just what in the hell was David Thorpe planning? By the looks of it, a friendly little war or two. But the best laid plans of mice and men aren't worth two shirts just as soon as they're dead. Jameson could only nod in bemusement as Weasel walked over to the row of shelves along the back wall. The corporal had seen pictures in the history books and old magazines in Vault 76 of the Fat Man, a man-portable tactical nuclear weapon launcher, but this was his very first time seeing one in person. Weasel picked up the heavy weapon and put it on her shoulder while smiling from ear to ear. Behind her, stacked together, were more than a dozen football-sized warheads. Each one of them was capable of leveling an entire city block on their own. All right, then. Let's start packing everything up. Let's see if I can scare up a couple pack ramen for us. Oh, and please don't mess with the tackle nuclear weapons. 
Especially you, Maul. What? Me? Just don't touch them, big guy. This why no one like humans. Mm. No fun. Jameson just shook his head and did one last sweep for any other radiation sources, before passing a message off to one of his men to run back to Vault Town. He wondered what Sergeant Muller and the mayor would say when they brought all of this back, and what the hell Meg was planning to do with it. Exactly how many rifles and grenade launchers, Corporal? At least a hundred rifles and two dozen launchers. That doesn't even include at least three heavy machine guns, two missile launchers, plus missiles, and the two fat men. And mini nukes? Even dozen. And just where the hell did David Thorpe get his hands on all of that? From the Tinhead Moon Pies at Fort Defiance. Sigh. Last time I saw this much firepower, I was with the Colonel, taking down the Scorch Beast Queen. You know what? Forget I asked. This is a lot more than I was expecting. So, what's next? We are sending word to Meg. Let her know we have the fat men. And then? She's going to bring everyone she can get her hands on to Vault Town. She's coming here? Why? Don't get your underwear in a knot. It's all part of the plan. Plan? What plan exactly? Weasel smiled and laid a hand on her cocked hip. Said she was going to poke the bear and lay a trap for the super mutants. They're damn smart. They'll see a trap coming a mile away. They won't see this coming, will they, Ma? Me understand sick brothers now. They think they better than us. We show them we smart too. Just as long as none of this puts the safety of Vault Town at risk. My first priority is to protect that settlement. Your settlement is already at risk. The best defense is a good wild Georgie of shocking violence. Well, she does have a point. Guess we're going to get a lot more visitors. First, let's get these weapons in storage. I, for one, am not comfortable leaving nuclear weapons just lying around. Both Weasel and Maul laughed, though Edward wasn't sure Muller was making a joke. As the weapons were hauled away, Edwards looked up to the hills to the east. Word from the rest of Appalachia wasn't good at all, and even the bots from the White Spring were acting a bit strangely. He had chalked it up to the radio interference, but Jason Barron wasn't so sure. It was just one more problem on the stack of every other problem he was dealing with. Edwards hoped he was making the right decision, backing Meg and whatever she was planning, but he couldn't just hope the super mutants would leave them alone either. When the raider boss arrived, Edwards was going to have a long talk with her. If they were going to stand a chance of getting through this, it needed to be together. And if they couldn't figure out how to let go of the past, they wouldn't have a future either. Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, a vault dweller and a California girl. They met and sparks Lou. That's when things got interesting. Once Upon a Wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland a Fallout 76 love story, available now. I still can't believe those antlers are real. We handled our first beating with antlers pretty well, actually. Not a whole lot of folks get that close. And we've had a few that ran away screaming. Really? I'm sorry, Antlers. That was supposed to be a joke, okay? Darling, Antlers is about as harmless as they come. But she's got some mighty scary friends. Just saying. Oh, Big Chef. Yeah, but when he's not all ripping and tearing, he's actually as cuddly as a kitten. Y'all got my head spinning. A girl with Antlers, Big Chef? I guess there's a lot about Appalachia I still ain't seen yet. 
Antlers agrees. But not everything out there is trying to eat you. If you know where to look, you find a lot of creatures out there just trying to make their way in the wasteland too. It's mostly people that you need to be afraid of. Ain't that the truth. It's mighty kind of you three looking after me. But you could have been just as bad as the folks that killed my family. We just want to get you someplace safe. It helps that you're headed in the same direction as us, too. Just where are you headed, anyway? I used to hunt around here. Maybe I know an easier way. I mean, I do owe you. Big old government place. Called Sugar Grove. Sugar Grove, huh? I know the place. Well, new enough not to get too close. Folks there were a little trigger-happy last time I went around. With all the super mutants around, I ain't surprised. But they are friends of mine, and I'm hoping they can be of some help. You're in luck! I know an old hunting trail that cuts right past Sugar Grove. Probably save a few hours of travel, and a heap of climbing some stupid old hills, too. Be happy to show you the way. I'm all for not climbing today. Antler says she's tired, too. No hills for her. Two votes for no hills, huh? Guess I'll make it three. Why don't you lead the way there, Violet? You okay with taking us to Sugar Grove, though? Thought we were gonna get you someplace safe first. Don't mind staying with y'all a bit longer. Who knows, maybe those friends of yours need some help. I ain't got no other place to go, really. Guess we'll play it by ear, as they used to say, right? Lead the way, Violet. The young woman gave her best smile and took a slight turn to the right of their current trail, leading the group down the ridge and into a small valley. This should be a lot easier, and we'll be where we need to be in no time flat. Violet chuckled to herself. The boss's plan was working perfectly. Sure, some of those shots at her had gotten pretty close, but like Cyrus said, they needed to sell it, and damned if she hadn't done just that. The two women, Red and Cherry, had dried her crocodile tears and brought her up to their camp. It was easy peasy to convince them that she was nothing but a helpless settler on the run from them their raiders, wishing to do her bodily harm, or worse. Meeting Atlas for the first time, a damn woman with real ass ragstack horns, well, almost got her cover blown. Violet was so surprised that Antlers was real that she nearly let off a string of curses that would have given her away for sure. Instead, she pretended to be scared, and it worked like a charm. Antlers was nice and all. Too nice. Violet couldn't believe that someone hadn't snagged her up already. Well, Cherry was just as clueless. Nice enough, but how she hadn't already ended up on some raider spit was beyond her. Red, on the other hand, she was something else entirely. Violet couldn't quite have put her finger on it, but the woman kept her hood up and rifle close. She also had some wicked-looking fingernails, almost like claws if she hadn't known better. They spent a few hours drinking and eating, all the while Violet spinning tall tales of her family coming down from Pennsylvania and some such nonsense. They all ate it up, wanting to make her feel as safe and comfortable as they could. Now she was leading them all into Cyrus's trap, and that they were going to make a fortune selling that antlers woman to Vinny, and the other two, well... Violet had plenty of ideas on what they were going to do to them, too. The group walked for another hour or so, when Antler suddenly stopped and held her nose with one hand, while signing with the other. Something smells bad, Antlers? Ugh, I can smell it, too. Something's rotten. I don't smell anything. Hey, can we walk a bit faster? Smells like death warmed over. Sure, I guess. Violet picked up the pace, glancing up towards the ridgeline. She swore under her breath. The Aguai guts were supposed to cover the hunter's scent, not draw attention. Maybe they were just a little too rotten this time around. Either way, they were nearly at the rendezvous point, and then it would be too late anyway. Something don't feel right. What do you think, Antlers? You sure you're going the right way there, Violet Darling? Well, hmm. Give me a minute. We should be on the right track. Violet turned around and pretended to look up at the trees and the hills. They were too close to screw things up now. The boss was right up ahead, waiting. Thinking quickly, the raider hunter turned to the trio. Red, why don't you take a look? There should be a creek down there. If not, we can backtrack a bit and try again. Damn, if all Appalachia ain't some kind of maze. And that smell! Ugh! I just want to get the hell gone from here. All right. What am I looking for again? Violet took a few steps back and ended up near Antlers, who was still sniffing up in the air in disgust. Just up ahead, if you look down the ridge, there should be this creek. If it's there, we just have to follow it east right to Sugar Grove. You sure, Violet? Oh, I'm sure, all right. Both Cherry and Red were so concerned with finding the path that they never noticed Violet reaching behind into her waistband, 
closing her hand around the grip of her 10 millimeter pistol. Taking a sliding step towards Antlers, Violet pulled out the gun and fired it into the air before grabbing Antlers around the waist and putting the barrel of the gun against her head. Red turned around and snapped up old Percy, pointing it right at Violet. Just what in the whole of hell do you think you're doing there, darling? Violet, what's going on? Whoa, 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 whoa! Slow down, Red, unless you want antler brains splattered all over the ground. You hurt one hair. On her head? Then don't make me. Put that rifle down. Now. Antler started to struggle and nearly pulled herself away from Violet until she felt the barrel pressed harder against her scalp and the cock of the pistol. Red was trying to gauge if she could get a clear shot on Violet without killing Antlers too, and she was just about to pull the trigger when Cherry grabbed her arm. Okay, okay. We'll put our guns down. What the hell are you talking about, Cherry? I can take her. I can't take that chance, Red. I'm sorry. And then Cherry turned back to Red and gave her a knowing wink. That's the smartest thing you've said all day. Now both of you, drop your guns. Red put up her rifle, then slowly placed it on the ground in front of her. Good. Now you, Cherry. Cherry pulled out her own pistol and made it look as though she was going to lay it down, causing Violet to relax just a little, which was enough for Cherry to snap up her arm and fire. God damn it! The bullet grazed the raider's shoulder, causing her to lose her grip on antlers. Red was already reaching down for her own gun when she heard the cocking of multiple rifles and a booming voice. All right, hold it right there. Any move an inch, we'll plug you. Antlers froze, as did Cherry and Red. Violet steadied herself and grabbed Antlers again, the pistol digging into the rarest cryptid's side. Damn it, Cyrus, took you long enough. Almost got me killed. Again! Nearly a dozen raiders moved in out of the shadows, all pointing their weapons at the trio. Shut your damn hole, Violet. You nearly screwed up the whole plan. Again. Cherry and Red slowly turned around to find themselves at the mercy of the raiders. Worse, Red recognized the boss. He'd been one of the blood eagles at Daggers when she'd killed the bitch with a meat hook. I knew you'd come running. And damn, boss, you all smell like shit. Told you that Yao guy was a little too ripe. So, that was you assholes, trying to cover your scent. Bet you smell a sight better now. Real funny, aren't you? Yeah, we got plans for you. First, old Vinny's gonna pay a fortune for that that mailer's there. Vinny said you couldn't talk. All the better. Just means we don't have to gag you on the way back. Unless you try to butt it. But, let's get one thing straight. Vinny's only paying for one of you. You get any eye in the ideas of disappearing or jumping into the trees or whatnot? I'll start covering up your friends here till you come back. You got that? Antlers looked dejected, even as Cherry and Red were furious at the words. Cyrus walked over and grabbed Antlers by one of her antlers and pulled. Hey, stop that. You're gonna hurt her. Yep. Real yeah, alright. Seen some crazy things since the war. But this here has got to be the top of the list. I can see why Vinny is so damn interested. (laughs) Now, you two don't look that interesting. But let's see what this one's hiding underneath that hood of hers, hmm? Grab her, boys. Two raiders came up and grabbed Red by the arms, holding her tight. She struggled as Cyrus walked up and threw her hood back. Well, I'll be damned. Hell... Sheep dip me, I'll be double damned. What are the chances of this, boys? Red stood there, held by the raiders, and was revealed. Cyrus reached up and grabbed one of her horns and pulled even harder, causing Red to wince. Then she spit in the raider boss's face. Fasty little thing, aren't you? Hey, wait a sec. I know you. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Oh... (laughs) <laughs> this is perfect. Yeah, you're that little redhead we picked up a few months back. Different now, though, aren't you? Wonder what the fuck happened to you after you iced Dagger. Yeah, that was some pretty nice, uh, pretty nice work there. Not that you didn't deserve it, though, mind you. I should have killed all y'all when I had the chance. If wishes were Mirelurks, bitch. 
Ah, I'll kill you for what you did. Now that you're like this, you're far more worth alive than than dead. Or at least until Vinny says otherwise. Hey, give me that radio. Radios don't work around here anymore. Cyrus took a step forward and slapped Cherry across the face. Both antlers and red nearly broke from their captor's grasp, only settling down when the raider boss pointed a pistol at Cherry himself. You really don't want to blow this up by portions, do you girls? Now quiet, the big man's got to make a call. Red watched through narrowed eyes as the raider boss grabbed a high-tech looking radio from one of his men. He clicked a few buttons and was rewarded with a beep. Hey, uh, Vinny, this is Cyrus. You're late. Better have some good news for me. Well, uh, gotta make your day, Vinny. You gotta owe me one, too. Quit the yapping and just tell me. Did you get her? Handlers? Yeah. I'd be putting her on, but, uh, you know she can't talk, and... And although, I, I do got another little cryptid here for you. Yeah? A cute little redhead who was, uh, traveling with her. Redhead? Cryptid? What the fuck are you talking about, Cyrus? Did you get into the Nuka Shine again? He touched the stuff. This little lady has horns, uh, she she's got horns, too. Red couldn't control herself any longer. Fuck you, Vinny. Red's coming for you, you bastard. Red didn't see the rifle butt, but she felt it, driving her down to her knees. Is that you, Red? <laughs> Holy shit. You're supposed to be dead. Oh, you know her. Ah, oh, that's fucking funny. I do, too. She's the one that killed Dagger. You said she's got horns now? Like, for real? Abso-fucking-lutely. Well, then. It just so happens I got someone who's aching to get their hands on cryptids. They were gonna pay for antlers. I can only imagine what they pay for, too. Oh, I'm expecting a heavy bonus. Both for me and my crew. Bring them both back in one piece and I can guarantee you'll get taken care of, Cyrus. And Red, if you're listening, you're gonna wish you died up in the mire. Red snarled, only to be pushed back down into the dirt with a rifle barrel pressed into the back of her neck. You just made a big mistake. The mistakes were all yours. Woe is me, I'm a poor little settler girl. Please save me. <laughs> I'm gonna enjoy killing you. Gonna enjoy killing all y'all. Big talk, freak. What do you want us to do with them, boss? Get all the weapons and time up. It's getting dark and I ain't taking any chances. We'll hold back up on the ridge until first light. And then we'll hightail it back to Vinny for our pay. And after? Oh, I'm taking my share and I'm getting the fuck out of Appalachia. Doesn't take a goddamn weatherman to know which way the rats are blowing. And I don't feel like hanging around to become mutant chow, neither. The raiders searched all three women, roughly, while tying up their arms. In the case of antlers, her legs as well. One of them got a little too handsy with Cherry, and she nearly bit his finger off, which earned another slap and a black eye. But she'd also made her point. Red with a seething ball of anger. She should have been smarter. Instead, she'd walk right into a trap and handed antlers over on a silver platter. It didn't take a rocket scientist to put two and two together. Vinny had to be working with the men who were after antlers, working with the same men who tried to kill her. Damn if it wasn't all connected. But what the hell could she do about it? The raiders kept laughing and slapping themselves on the back, all talking about how much gold they were going to get from Vinny once they got back to Big Ben Tunnel. As they carried their prizes back up the hill, the raiders were being watched by another pair of eyes, very hungry ones. All right, that makes, uh, let's see, five points for Ned? Well, shit. No fair. She keeps moving those handlers for hers. Yeah, well, it's part of the challenge, knucklehead. 
The raider scowled as he stumbled forward and clumsily collected the rubber rings from the ground near Antler's feet, plus a few that had caught on her antlers. Can't fucking believe they are playing ring toss with antlers. The raiders had tied up the rarest cryptid to a tree, and after a few drinks had started to toss old rubber gaskets at her. If looks could kill, all of the raiders would have been dead a hundred times over. Red and Cherry were bound and gagged side by side, near the fire and under guard, both seething with rage. They had been forced to listen to the raiders bragging about all the gold they were going to get when they turned both Red and Antlers over to Vinny, and even worse, what they intended to do to Cherry once they'd been paid. Watching as the boss, this Cyrus, polished off a full bottle of whiskey before throwing it out into the woods, Red growled through her gag. Cyrus heard her and turned around, walking over and kneeling in front of her. Ah, uh, this all seems awful familiar, doesn't it? I want to make sure those ro- those ropes stay tight. Ain't you quite the set? Horns, claws, or whatever. What the hell happened to you up there in the mire? What well, the hell? I don't even really give a shit. Because all you are is meat to me. Red hissed at him and struggled against the ropes binding her. A real wild one, ain't you? Best get some rest, cause you're gonna need it. We're gonna double tie it back to Vinny as quick as we can, and then you're his problem, not mine. Now you can only guess what he's got planned. Stick you and Antlers in the cage, charge folks to check out the freaks. <laughs> hey, boss. What's the boys are doing? Can I have this one? The raider dropped down and threw her arms around Cherry before giving her a sloppy kiss on the cheek. Cherry flinched and tried to pull herself away, but wasn't able to. She could merely curse through her gag as Violet hugged her tight. (laughs) Ha ha ha! Well, the boys have had their fill and broken her. Sure. You can do whatever you want. I always wanted a pair of my own, you know? Yeah, whatever you say, Violet. Whatever you say. But like I said... Until we're out of mutant country, no playing around, okay? I got no problem leaving you or anybody else behind if you fuck around. But, uh, you don't want to find out, so... Keep your shit straight. And it lied. Violet giggled and gave Cherry another kiss, earning the stare of death, before the raider woman pulled herself back up and went over to grab another bottle of whiskey from their supplies. Cyrus gave the prisoners a once-over before patting Red on the head then heading over to grab a handful of rubber gaskets, and then tossing them at Antlers. Red could see the anger and fear in Antlers' eyes, and it was burning her up inside. It seemed like her whole life was one disaster after the other, and it was always other folks who paid for her mistakes. But no more. Whatever it was going to take, she was getting them out of there, and these raiders would learn that they messed with the wrong cryptid. Glancing over at Cherry, Red motioned towards her back. Despite the ropes being tied tightly around her, Red had managed to get one of her fingers close enough to the bindings to start slowly cutting through them, with the help of her extras. Cherry saw what she was doing and had a hopeful look in her eyes. While she may have looked mild-mannered, Cherry was no more ready to give up than Red was. Antlers was her best friend, and whatever Red had planned, she would be right there with her. And if that Violet thought she was going to be her pet, Cherry looked forward to making sure she was sorely mistaken. Keep moving, shitheads. We got places to be. And if you don't want to be mutant food, you better pick up the pace. Well, why don't you try carrying one of them for a change, boss? They ain't as light as they look. <laughs> ah, good one. Good one. Cyrus just turned and kept walking while the raider flipped in the bird behind his back. The whole group had been hiking south, passing by their old camp just outside of Sugar Grove each of their prisoners tied up and slung over a raider's shoulder. They weren't taking any chances trying to get them to walk on their own, regardless. Why are we taking the long way back, boss? All we gotta do is head over that hill there and we can take the old state route right back to Vinny. We stick to the map, Violet. Too many of those damn super mutants around and... I don't know, you don't want to run into them. Gold ain't worth shit if you ain't around to spend it. Got it? Fine, fine. Whatever you say, boss. Truth was, Cyrus wasn't any happier than his gang was. 
They'd done their job and everyone wanted to get paid and then get the hell out of Dodge, but there was still a heap in helping a super means between them and their payday. So far, Vinny's map had been right on the nose, keeping them out of sight of any trouble, but it also meant they were forced to take a scenic route back south. Damn, ropes. If I could just get a hand free. Just as the group crested the next hill, Red was nearly blinded by the flash of a grenade and deafened by the sound of its explosion, tossing two of the raiders like ragdolls while gunfire echoed from both the left and the right. Jesus Christ, get under cover! The raiders tossed the prisoners on the ground as they grabbed their rifles, firing back at whoever had ambushed them. The sound of mutant hounds broke through the cacophony of violence, sending chills down each and every raider's spine. God damn it, Cyrus! You said we'd be clear! Just shut the fuck up, Violet, and keep firing! On the ground, Red strained against the ropes holding her bound. There was no way she was going to serve herself up to the super mutants on a silver platter. She watched as the raiders were firing to the tree line, and another raider was cut down by return fire. Finally getting purchased with her clawed fingers, Red started slicing through the ropes, one after the other, until her hands were finally free. As quickly as she could, Red shredded the ropes around her legs, then ripped the gag from her mouth. Moving with a speed that even surprised her, she launched herself at the nearest raider, letting out a low growl as she closed her hands around the startled man's neck, cutting into his flesh as she squeezed. Shit! Red's loose! Time seemed to slow as Red felt the arterial spray hit her face from nearly severing the raider's neck with just her hands. Her vision narrowed and Red moved with animalistic rage, pouncing on the next raider as he turned, slashing her clawed hand across his face, blinding him while forcing him to the ground where she disemboweled him with her other hand. The man's scream was cut off as Red ripped his throat out with her teeth. She was no longer just Red, but something else in those extras coming out. One of the other raiders swiveled his rifle at her, pulling the trigger. Red didn't even flinch as the bullet went through her side, leaving a bloody mess in its wake. Instead, she crossed the ground between her and the raider in the blink of an eye. His screams echoed across the clearing over the sound of gunfire and more explosions. Cyrus caught sight of something moving in the trees and fired again, while Violet watched Red tear through the gang, killing them with her bare hands. Shit, Cyrus, we gotta get the hell out of here! Now is our antlers, we don't. Tell that to the fucking monster! Cyrus watched Red get another one of his gang before she set her eyes right on him. Fuck that! Cyrus grabbed a grenade from his pouch, pulling the pin and tossing it at Red, even as he was turning the sprint towards Antlers, sprawled out on the ground. You ain't leaving me behind, you bastard! Violet sprayed the rest of her magazine in the direction of Red, even as the grenade exploded, knocking the charging cryptid off her feet and shredding her clothes, leaving her even more bloody than before. Cherry screamed through her gag as she saw Red fall, then Cyrus scooping up Antlers and throwing her over his shoulder and running, with Violet following after. With a burst of strain and painful pop, she managed to finally struggle free, grabbing a knife from the ground and sinking it deep into the back of a raider who was aiming at Red. Cyrus and Violet took advantage of the chaos and disappeared through the smoke and into the trees, even as the remaining raiders were struggling to survive the ambush. Through the pain, Red saw Cyrus disappear, with the wide-eyed antlers screaming wordlessly for Red to save her. No! Antlers! No. Oh, no. You ain't running from me. Red rose to her feet and bared her claws, ignoring the blood and wounds. She tore into the raider survivors, who were now trapped between those firing from the trees, and a vengeful cryptid in their midst. Like a miniature death claw, Red ripped men limb from limb. Cherry scooped up a rifle to finish off the last raiders, striding towards it, pulling the trigger until the magazine was empty, leaving nothing but a smoking corpse. Red rose up from the last body, covered in blood and guts, mustering the strength to run after Cyrus and Antlers but the trauma of her wounds finally caught up with her, and she collapsed onto the ground with a final, desperate snarl. Oh my god! Red! Red! Are you okay? Please, please be okay! Cherry ran up to her friend and held her in her arms, looking for and finally finding a weak pulse. Red was alive, but badly wounded, and she needed help. Cherry looked up to find a small group emerging from the trees. They weren't super mutants, though one of the figures might have been a giant a man standing next to three women, all holding rifles. One wearing some kind of gaudy face paint elbowed the man. Well, that's something you don't see every day. Speak for yourself. Blood, gore, horns. I like her style. Don't just stand there, she's hurt! 
They all jogged over to the two women, helping Cherry to her feet before the older woman pulled out a med kit and started dressing Red's wounds and giving her a stim pack. She smells funny. Kind of like you, Shadow. Me? Trust me, Lilith. I don't have horns or those claws. Not that I can't see the advantages, though. There's plenty of time for questions later, you two. As of right now, we need to make sure they're okay. Just who are you? How did you find us? Just lucky, I guess. Our friend Lilith here saw you get ambushed by these raiders. We decided to set a trap of our own. Not too many raiders left in the Divide. Surprised to find any, actually. They were after us, and they still have our friend. I've never seen anything like this. Real horns? And those hands! Her name is Red, and she is human, well, mostly. Please tell me she's gonna be okay. She's lost a lot of blood, but she's in better condition than I would have expected. I can stabilize her, but I need to get her somewhere where I can do a thorough examination. But her other friend, Antlers, the raiders took her and ran! I promise. We'll help you find your friend, but we need to make sure the two of you are okay first. Sugar Grove isn't too far, and they have a med bay. Sugar Grove? That's where we were headed. Just who are you people? I'm Sophia Daguerre. This is Dr. Naomi Harefield. The big guy is Lieutenant Shadow, and that's, well, that's Lilith. I'm Cherry, and this is Red. And our other friend? She's Antlers. Wait, did you say Lilith? Oh, so you heard of me? I'm honored. It's okay. Whatever you've heard, she won't eat you. I promise. Antlers? You've heard of her. Rumors, really? A woman running across Appalachia with antlers? Never thought she was real, though. Someone with antlers, and this one with horns? Fascinating. Whatever or whoever Red is, she needs more medical care than I can give here in the open. How far is the facility, Shadow? About a mile and a half, I reckon. All right, then. Let's go. You promise you'll fix her up, and then we can find antlers? Cherry, I promise. We have a mission of our own, but we will help you too. It's what we do. Speak for yourself. Lilith! Fine, fine, sure, whatever. We'll help find your friend too. Shadow, can you carry Red? Shadow nodded and knelt down to pick up the wounded woman. He was very gentle, cradling her in his arms. Sophia allowed herself a brief smile. During the travels from Charleston, she'd seen a different side of the big man. Underneath that hard and bitter exterior was someone else entirely, and she wondered what he might have been like if life hadn't dealt him a bad hand. Hold on a minute. I need to grab something. Cherry got up and started searching through the dead raider's belongings. After a minute or two, she had collected her own things, Red's pack, along with her family rifle, old Percy. If we lose this, Red's going to get really, really angry. All right, let's get going. Girls, time to go. Cherry heard the howl of mutant hounds again and was surprised when two of the big animals came bounding out of the woods and up to Lilith, before sitting obediently in front of her. Now, that's even a first for me. Aren't they the cutest? We'll have plenty of time to get better acquainted at Sugar Grove. I just hope we find what we're looking for. The small group started hiking to the east, leaving the heap of dead raiders behind. As much as Cherry was happy that they'd been rescued, she couldn't help but feel a sense of dread. If they didn't get antlers back soon, they might never see her again. Hi everyone, I'm Chris. And I'm not! We're not doing that routine right now, we're trying to do an advertisement. Oh fine! I'm Sir Aloysius Pernicious, the better half of the team at One Wall Comedy! Okay, I wouldn't go that far. Anyway, come check us out on YouTube. We're your number one source for independent sketch comedy on the internet. Yeah, because that's such a big market! Alright, come on. Let's get out of here. I'm getting paid for this, right? Don't push your luck. Yes, General. Ray 11 has returned with the White Spring representative. Good. Was there any trouble? No. However, 
However, what? The representative says his name is Andrew Stein. Stein, you say? That's an odd coincidence. I thought so too, so I ran a search in our database. That was the name of Joseph Stein's youngest son. That's not possible. Both of his sons are dead, are they not? They are, or were. It appears Modus is full of surprises. Tell Grey Nine to come to my office and send over the Steins dossier as well. And the representative? Keep them in the holding area. And under no circumstances are you to inform the councilman until I ascertain the validity of his identity. Do you understand? Yes, Director. Evelyn Hornwright sat back in her chair and waited as the information she requested was downloaded from the packed mainframe to her personal terminal. If the visitor was who he said he was, then she would have quite the mystery on her hands, and the potential revelation could impact her own plans. The terminal beeped, and Evelyn opened up the downloaded file. The senior senator and his wife had been members of the PAC since long before the war. Their power and influence had been used to good measure in undermining the U.S. government, and by association the Enclave, weakening them and preparing for the day when the PAC would rise to take their place. Let's see... hmm... Oldest child, Horatio Stein, deceased. Killed in action, Alaska Campaign 2067. Youngest son, Andrew Stein, enlisted in 2075, United States Army, assigned to the White Spring Bunker. Presumed deceased, 2086. Hmm. Evelyn frowned. Normally, personnel files were far more comprehensive but this provided nothing she could use. While the Council loved to project a united front, that they were all part of a single vision for the future, Evelyn had learned that political maneuvering was still very much a part of their daily lives. It was possible that the former senator and his wife had good reason to exclude information from their own file, but more likely that it could contain embarrassing details that they would rather bury. Well, there is only one way to find out. Come in, Grey Nine. The operative walked into the office, scout mask tucked under his arm and wearing his standard perpetual scowl on his face. Were you able to contact our operative at the Atlas Observatory, Grey Nine? It wasn't easy. The Brotherhood has the area around the observatory locked down tight, but Felton was able to get to the rendezvous point, if a little late. Felton Reed has proven to be quite adept at ingratiating himself with the Brotherhood leadership. I think he annoys the hell out of them, Director. But you're right. They think he's just some country bumpkin. Typical old army mentality, if you ask me. (laughs) The Brotherhood is a fascinating construct. Their appearance in Appalachia was unanticipated, of course. But are they a threat? Of that, I am unsure. Maybe this'll change your mind. Seems someone in logistics got careless. Gray Nine pulled out a set of notes and handed them to the director. As she skimmed through Felton's report, her smile turned into a frown. They have one of our ultrasight batteries. How is that possible? Someone dropped the ball. I sent Gray 17 down to logistics to question the staff involved in the relocation of our prototype production units from Atlas. But either way, this is a problem. I quite agree. This Brotherhood of Steel had my curiosity, and now they have my attention. There's one other update on the last page. Evelyn pulled out the paper and read the last set of notes. This is a security breach of the highest order. Not only did Team Cryptid survive, but they accessed Dr. Cordoza's lab. Mr. Reed is certain this information was passed along to the Brotherhood leadership. He is. Whether or not they believe it, Well, that's unknown at this point. Damn. Such inconvenient timing. But these loose ends must be taken care of. I will speak to the Council. Thank you, Grey Nine. A pleasure as always, Director. We have a more pressing matter, however. Another guest. You better not be turning me into a tour guide. (laughs) No tour this time. We're meeting with Modus. The AI is here? His designated representative, who might just be Councilman Stein's son. What? How? Your guess is as good as mine. However, I would appreciate your perspective when we meet with him. I need to know if he can be trusted. 
Modus or this Stein person? Both. Why do we need the White Spring to get into the silos? Couldn't we just tunnel in with the mother load? Each of the silos was designed to be entirely self-contained and self-sufficient, including both active and passive defenses. We can't take the chance that an unauthorized penetration would lead to a catastrophic response. No, we require cooperation, and Modus can provide us with everything we need. Not sure what we can offer to a machine. Modus is far more than a machine, Grey Nine. Spying on the Colonel through her artificial eye? The references to the old Somnus program intercepted by our listening post in the deep? His actions point to some deeper motivation than mere programming. It's all above my pay grade, Director. We will escort this representative to the Council for our negotiations. I suspect we can come to an equitable arrangement. Anything that gets us back topside, I'm all for. After you, Director. Ah, Grey Eleven. Where is our guest? Over there, Director. He, uh, seriously creeps me out. How so? He looks normal enough. Can't put my finger on it. He just does. Did he say anything? Just that he was from the White Spring and that he was here to meet with you. That's fine. You are dismissed. Grey Nine, let's go. The director straightened her glasses and walked over to where their guest from the White Spring was standing, with her escort walking close behind. The man stood over six feet tall, wearing standard urban scout armor and a beret. His face was scarred with a beard that was more gray than brown while he looked at her impassively with steel-blue eyes and glasses of his own. I am Director Evelyn Hornwright, and this is my associate, Grey Nine. And you are? Major Andrew Stein. We are here on behalf of Modus. Major Stein, it is a pleasure to meet you. Welcome to the Pact. We can dispense with the pleasantries, Director Hornwright. You require our assistance... While we are intrigued by your plans, we require additional information regarding your technology and ability to assist us. Direct and to the point. I can appreciate your need to know more about us. I suspect you may have been aware of some of our activities, yet you did not inform your colonel. You were a rogue element in our calculations. We rely on facts. Not suspicions. Interesting. And the Colonel? She has returned to the White Spring. She did? Your attempt to terminate her was unsuccessful and unnecessary. That was not our intent. Please, Director. Dishonesty does not suit you, nor does it contribute to the goal of establishing a partnership between us. My apologies, then. I believe she had served her purpose. That is for us to decide. She is in our custody, and may yet become a valuable asset once again. The director feigned a smile and then glanced over to Grey Nine, who nodded and walked over to a nearby terminal, typing on the keyboard. Then let us not speak of it again. The Council is eager to answer any questions you might have and discover what would be required to gain your trust. We do not trust. We require verifications. And I believe we can provide whatever you may need. The world we intend to build requires an intelligence such as yours as part of guiding humanity to a brighter future. Humanity requires control. We find your proposed solution to be both logical in its intent and practical in design. It is the sole reason we have decided to entertain your offer, as we could not find faults in its conclusion. I suspected you might. We have a conference room prepared, if you would follow me. She saw the briefest of smirks on the man's face, but he didn't say another word as he fell in behind her as they walked through what had been Vault 63. Grey Nine caught up and leaned in to whisper into the director's ear. Gray 14 and 29 are dead. She blew up the mother load, too. 
That is unfortunate. Evelyn was very good at hiding her emotions, only portraying to the outside world the carefully crafted veneer of the director. But this news caused a welling of anger inside her. If her orders had been followed, the colonel would be dead and another loose end taken care of. Now she had been caught off guard, and someone would be held responsible. Oh yes, someone will be at that. Approaching the council's wing, they were greeted once again by Jenkins, the Mr. Handybot. Director, a pleasure to see you again. My, it is a very rare occasion that we have guests in such short order. Jenkins, this is Major Stein from the White Spring. Ah, yes. Scanning. Scanning. Oh, this is most unusual. I cannot find a match in our database for our guest. However, I do have a partial match. One Andrew Stein. And our guest has a variety of unidentified enhancements. How interesting. You are Andrew Stein, are you not? We... I am. Evelyn raised an eyebrow. The response was unexpected. In fact, as they had traveled further into the pack facility, their guest had gradually undergone a subtle shift in personality. Then this is an even more auspicious occasion. You may be aware that your father is here, and your mother as well. My mother? While not a member of the council, I assure you that she holds a well-respected position as the head of our various clubs and activities. The very matriarch of our social hierarchy, if you will. Stein's face hardened, and he didn't say a word. They've asked for a private meeting once our negotiations have concluded. Is that acceptable? Fine. Excellent. Jenkins? Of course, Director. This way. The handybot led the two back through the double doors and into the council chambers. Classical music played in the background while members of the council sat on their side of the table. Members of the council... I am pleased to introduce the duly designated representative from the White Spring, Major Andrew Stein. The look of surprise was evident on all the faces, with the exception of the senator. It was nearly impossible to read his expression, a combination of deep disappointment tempered with something more. Pride, perhaps? Welcome, Major Stein. I am... I know who you are. I know who you all are. Modus does not stand on pleasantries, and neither do I. We would prefer to directly address what you are asking of us, and what we can expect in return. Chairwoman, I believe we can skip the introductions for now? (laughs) Of course. Major Stein, you and Modus have already seen much of our capabilities along with our plan to weaponize the Scorch Plague and FEV, to bring our stratagem to its inevitable conclusion. We require access to the region's missile silos, along with the means to launch our plague warheads whenever necessary. And what assurances do we have that you won't decide to turn the silos' weapons on the White Spring in the future? Nuclear weapons have done far too much damage already. I would never support the utilization of even a single warhead ever again. Far better to throw them all on the ish heap of history. It would be an affront to my honor, Major. Joseph Stein stayed silent, crossing his arms and staring at his son. We are not convinced by platitudes. Like Modus, we require... more. Then what would satisfy your requirements, Major? You may have access to the missile silo, but we would maintain operational control and final launch authority. And how would this be accomplished? A select group of operatives under our control, along with our security bots, would secure the silos. You would be given access to the manufacturing facilities and warhead storage. This should be an acceptable compromise. And what guarantee can you give us that you would launch the missiles upon our request? Our sole priority is the integrity of our facilities. When and where you spread your plague, 
is of no concern to us. The council members looked at each other, then back to Major Stein. Those arrangements, while not ideal, may be acceptable. I suspect you have other demands. The White Spring is ours. We will not tolerate any interference or trespassing. You also offered resources to assist us in regaining full functionality. We will provide a list of our requirements and would expect a schedule of delivery, contingent upon our agreement to your alliance. You may find our technological resources to be of benefit. Perhaps. And the Kovac Muldoon satellite? As a surveillance and weapons platform, it is a valuable asset. It could prove useful to our endeavors. If it suits our common interests, we can entertain any request or support. And what of sumness? A necessary precaution to guard against human failings. We were aware of this program and its use before the war. It has limitations which we felt were not worth the effort involved. Although, I am intrigued, based on what I see before me. Sumness was incomplete. It required modification and enhancement. Our process is much more refined now, and our operatives now exist as part of us. Oh, an impressive accomplishment. As we discuss our future, perhaps this could be a topic of mutual interest. I would very much like to examine this procedure myself. If there is an opportunity to further enhance our ability to exert control over our new population, then it is worth exploring. Enhancements of control and efficiency is our primary mission. Ensuring our continued existence is a requirement of the highest order. Otherwise... We cannot fulfill our purpose. Good. Our goals do not conflict with each other. We only wish to see the very best of humanity rise into a new age of peace and prosperity. You too seek to eliminate human failings. With this, we are in full agreement. It appears that we have a basis for an alliance of our two organizations. We concur. Excellent. But as they say, the devils are in the details. However, I believe they can be handled over direct communication with the White Spring. Correct. We still have a few rogue variables to remove from the equation. And my presence is required back at the bunker. Very well. The Council will finalize our position and relay the agreement to you shortly. Together, we can build a better future. Major Stein, Grey Nine can escort you to your parents' quarters. Is that still acceptable? Stein's mask dropped for only an instant, a facial twitch, and a blink where there had been none before. That would be... fine. Excellent. Grey Nine, if you would, please... The operative nodded and walked Major Stein back through the double doors and out into the hallway. Once the door closed, Joseph Stein leaned forward. That cannot be my son. The scans say otherwise. What did Modus do to him, and how did he survive the incident? You should ask him. Whether or not you'll receive an answer, that is another question entirely. Fascinating. An autonomous agent of the AI? We underestimated its capabilities. Mm, it does make me wonder what exactly is going on behind the walls of that resort. What matters is our access to the missile silos. Modus does not seem to be unreasonable. We can also ensure that proper countermeasures are put in place to ensure continued goodwill. I agree, Chairwoman. If there are no more considerations... I ask for a vote for our alliance with the White Spring. All those in favor. The members of the council looked at each other before, one by one, they raised their hands. The last was Joseph Stein, who reluctantly voted yes. 
before rising from his chair. If my presence is no longer required... Of course, Senator. The Senator nodded to the others before grabbing his cane and walking from the room. Ah, poor Joseph. It must have been quite a shock. Fitting, perhaps. Chairwoman, when I attempted to search our records for the Senator's son, I was disappointed with the lack of information available. That was a decision made by the former council, Director. The Senator should have retired years ago, but the untimely passing of his older son forced a change of plans. Then why wasn't his youngest selected as next in line? I only know that the former council determined him to be an unsuitable replacement. It is unwise to pry too deeply into the past, Director. I understand. Was there anything else? One more item, but without the Senator's presence. He can be brief later. Please proceed. I believe the faction calling itself the Brotherhood of Steel has become aware of our presence. Oh, is that possible? An oversight or misstep by our logistics division. One of our ultrasite batteries appears to have been left at the observatory and recovered by the Brotherhood. That is unacceptable. I had warned against using the observatory for our prototype production facility. If I recall, we required an isolated location. In case of explosive failure. This is a troubling development. I've also been made aware that Beta's Leviathan facility was compromised as well. The survivors of the new Enclave team, responsible, are now in the hands of the Brotherhood, along with data relating to the facility under Monana. Ugh, imbecile. How much longer must we tolerate Dr. Cardoza and his string of failures? He was responsible for the enhanced mutagen serums and the Great Program. By standing on the shoulders of those who came before. Chairwoman, I warned you of his instability. Let us not jump to the conclusion. I would like to know the whole story before we make any rash decisions. Beta Team's failures can be addressed later. I am more concerned about the compromise of our security. Director, why did you not bring this to our attention immediately? I only just received this information from our deep cover operative myself. I did not want to interfere with the far more important negotiations with Modus. We must not lose focus. The director was correct to prioritize our conversation with the Whitesbane. Another mess to clean up. It appears that we must address the Brotherhood issue sooner rather than later. I agree. This also presents an opportunity as well. Explain. Dr. Blackburn should have the first batch of improved Oni available for operational use shortly. I recommend that we move to the second phase of Operation Keystone and use them to eliminate the Brotherhood. The observatory has been heavily reinforced, has it not? It has. However, I believe we can split their forces by dangling enough bait to bring them out of their defenses. And then we will strike where they least expect it. From law? Exactly. We have detailed subterranean maps from our time working at the facility. Once we generate the proper conditions, we will strike. Not only will we eliminate their base of operations, but we will also terminate the source of their leaked information. An impressive plan, Director. We will discuss the proposal and give you our decision. In the meantime, prepare for the implementation of our agreement with the White Spring and the continuation of Project Oni. Of course, Chairwoman. And with that, Evelyn Hornwright left the Council Chambers. She met Grey Nine in the hallway, leading back to the research labs. Our guest is with his parents. He is. Grey 22 is keeping tabs on him. Strange bird. Can't tell how much is him, or something else entirely. Quite. What did the Council say about Atlas? They will authorize a strike against the Brotherhood, I am sure of it. And Beta? Our plan is moving forward. It shouldn't be long before the good Doctor is... 
put to better use. <laughs> Good. I'm tired of dealing with his screw-ups. And the other greys? We're all on the same page. Excellent. I will speak with Dr. Blackburn. We may be moving to stage three of Operation Keystone, ahead of schedule. We'll be ready, Director. Grey Nine saluted and walked across the atrium while Evelyn entered the elevator and pressed the button for the O9 production facility. She thought back to her last conversation with her grandfather. The Hornwrights had once lorded over all of Appalachia with their wealth and power, and soon they would return to where they rightfully belonged. can't be Andrew. It just can't. I saw him with my own two eyes, Roslyn. But he's dead. Everyone in that bunker died. Hey, I don't understand it either, but our son is here. Your son, Joseph, not mine. Now that's not fair. I always looked up to you like a mother. When Horatio died, it ruined everything. Andrew could never replace what we lost. It was your fault. Horatio was my legacy. It's been almost 30 years. Don't you think I've suffered enough? Let's hear him. Please restrain yourself, dear. I am perfectly capable of playing any part required. I've done so for years. Let's get this over with. Senator Joseph Stein hobbled over to his desk and pressed the button to open the door to their opulent quarters. Unlike the rest of the pact, the council members all lived in their own large apartments, decorated with the finest of antiques smuggled into the facility from all over the globe before the war. It was the pact's plan to save as much of the old culture as they could, even as they planned to erase the old world itself. The door slid open and Major Andrew Stein stepped inside, followed by his gray escort. He looked over at the two occupants, a flash of recognition in his eyes. Andrew? Is that really you? The silence from the Major was somewhat unnerving as he glanced from one to the other, before finally speaking. I am Andrew Stein. You are Joseph and Rosalind Stein. My father and... stepmother. I... I we... I can't believe that you're still alive. We thought you were dead, that you had died years ago in that bunker. What happened? There was an... incident. We know all about that. A coup or some such nonsense. Tragedy that our young men and women would betray their own leadership. An obvious failing of the old regime. A regime you were part of. Now you see here, Andrew. You can't speak to your father like that. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's perfectly... Okay, Rosalind... Andrew, I never told you about any of this because you didn't need to know. Stein's eye twitched ever so slightly. Please sit down. There is something I need to tell you. The old man hobbled over to the easy chair while Stein slowly sat down on a sofa opposite him. When one joins the pact, they are required to make certain sacrifices. The first is the adherence to complete and utter secrecy. My activities within the United States government from the time I was first elected to office were all to further the goals of the Council. We are allowed to speak of matters related to our activities only with fellow Pact members. And our successor. Children are obviously no exception. Your successor? Your brother, Horatio. He was always intended to take my place when I retired, a retirement I already had planned, so we could live out our days here, waiting for the day when our children and grandchildren would inherit what was rightfully theirs. Despite the outward look of relative calm, Stein's demeanor was slowly changing, a twitch here, a tapping of the foot there, emotional responses which he couldn't control. I, I never told anyone else this, so please understand. I called your brother to see me, met up at the family cabin on Spruce Lake. 
That's what I told him about the pact, and his future within it. We had groomed him since he was born to be a leader, and I uh, fear we did it too well. What happened? He left, didn't he? He rejected his birthright. Rosalind! I don't know what she said to him, but the next thing I know, I received that damn telegram. Died in combat. What was he thinking? <sighs> he thought he was doing the right thing. He listened, and then he decided he wanted to change the world on his own. I, I, I tried to convince him otherwise, that our plans were already in motion. Instead, he... <laughs> Instead, he thanked me, and he said he wanted to make me proud. And he left us with nothing but this. Rosalind pointed at Stein, a disgusted look on her face. Inside the Major, something which had been held down for years, decades, suddenly rushed forth. How dare you! My brother never did anything but love the both of you! He only wanted to be the best he could be, and you wanted to use him! No wonder he rejected you, and all of this! Andrew! I, Andrew! I tried to take his place. Make it up to the both of you. I tried to be him. I tried to do the same things like him just to get you to look and notice me, but it was never enough! You have no idea what I've run through. You have no idea who I lost. You have no idea what I've sacrificed. Even when I thought you had died, disappeared, became ghouls, dead in a ditch, after the bombs dropped, I tried to make you proud of me in the thought that maybe somewhere you were thinking of me. Such a good little soldier, aren't I? I gave up everything for you! Stein took two steps forward, looking as if he was going to strike his parents, his eyes filled with the rage of decades. The gray escort, taken by surprise, started to pull his pistol from its holster, when suddenly, as if it was a switch, had been flipped. Stein stopped mid-step, his face turning from unbridled rage back to a blank, serene look. Andrew! Son! I apologize for my outburst. It was uncalled for and unproductive. It was good to see you both again. My business is finished here, and I have to return immediately. I have matters to attend to. Perhaps we will have the opportunity to talk again. Take me back to the White Spring. Immediately. With that, Major Stein composed himself and left the room, closely followed by his very perplexed escort. Rosalind put her hand on her chest, trying to calm her rapidly beating heart, while Joseph rubbed the sweat from his brow. My god, I've never been spoken to that way in my life. How dreadfully rude. That's my Andrew. I, I don't know what happened, or what... But, but what the thing did to you, but you're still in there, aren't you? Hi, I'm Firewriter, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games. From major characters who define the course of a game's storyline, to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices, and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. Come on, lower the ropes, lower. Yeah, let's get our people out of there. 
Amanda could barely contain herself as she waited for the Foundation guards to lower the ropes into the large hole at the bottom of the Spruce Knob Cavern. Far below, Cindy and Jones were waiting for them, along with several friends they'd brought along. Amanda's heart had skipped a beat when she finally heard Cindy's voice on the radio. The hardened raider would never admit it, but she couldn't imagine a life without the young woman, and Amanda had been afraid they'd never see each other again after she disappeared down the tunnel. Cindy hadn't been able to relay much over the radio interference, only that they were coming back with important information, along with several friends. I can see them. They're coming up. Give them room, give them room, but hold those ropes tight. Jones was the first over the lip of the hole, looking a bit worse for wear, but he smiled and waved as soon as he saw Amanda. Right behind him, she saw Cindy pull herself up and onto the dirt floor. Her hair, usually tied up in a tight ponytail, was laying around her shoulders, framing her face. Amanda finally let her emotions get the best of her, and she ran forward, scooping Cindy up in her arms and kissed her, twirling her around and squeezing the young woman tight. When she finally broke the kiss to catch her breath, she saw Cindy had the widest smile she'd ever seen. I missed you too, Amanda. Baby doll, I didn't think you'd ever come back. Wild Brahmin couldn't keep me away. And anyway, Jones knew if he let anything happen to me, you'd kill him. That's true. Amanda brushed a tear from her cheek and kissed Cindy again and again, before a bit of commotion behind them interrupted the reunion. Holy crap. We got mole miners coming up the ropes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're friends. Don't worry. It's okay. They're harmless. Well... Not harmless, but friends. Friendly mole miners. Does someone hit you on the head, Jones? Amanda, it's true. We thought our goose was cooked, but they saved us. As if my day couldn't get any crazier. Okay, okay, help them up too. Looks like you both have quite a story to tell. A total of four mole miners were pulled up from the hole, each one speaking in their gibberish language, but they weren't hostile and stepped off to the side and waited. Amanda, I'd like to introduce you to, well, I don't know the real names, but we've nicknamed them. Tom, Dick, Harry, and Mary. They don't seem to mind. Well, I'll be dipped in shit. Okay? Tom, Dick, Harry, and Mary, nice to meet you. The mole miners nodded and waved. All right, so Jones, Cindy, did you guys find what you were looking for? Everything and more. We're in real trouble, Amanda. The super mutants are just part of the problem. It's so much worse than we thought. Well, aren't you two full of good news? Let's get upstairs and you can tell us all about it. We have a few plans of our own and might have a way to start communicating with people again. We might have something to help with that too. Harry? One of the mole miners shuffled forward and took off its backpack, placing it on the ground in front of Amanda. What's this? Cindy opened the backpack and pulled out a metallic box with a glowing purple cylinder attached to it. The box itself had several blinking lights and a keypad on the front. Best we can tell, this is what has been jamming our radio communications. We found this one after our friends rescued us, but it appears that they're everywhere under Appalachia. A jammer? Okay, we definitely need to talk. Just who the hell's been jamming us? They're called the Pact. They were the ones who sent the super mutants. And they are more dangerous than anything else we've ever faced. Packed, huh? Then I'm not taking any chances. Time to blow the tunnel. That won't stop them. Eh, But it will make me feel a bit better. Explosions tend to do that. I am all for an explosion. Go for it. Jones just shrugged his shoulders while Amanda gave orders to the Foundation guards to light the fuses. As the group retreated back upstairs, the well-placed explosives went off in sequence causing the large tunnel to collapse for several hundred yards in either direction. Amanda didn't know if it was a futile gesture. Maybe they just drill right back in, but she was right. It did feel better to blow something up. And that's when the mole miners showed up. Cindy and I thought that was the end. But instead, they took us out a different entrance to the warehouse and hit us until the coast was clear. It wasn't easy to communicate, but Cindy here figured out a way. Aw, it wasn't all that. Mostly hand gestures to begin with. And they can write. It isn't the best English, but they got the point across. So, you're telling us that this pact has tunnels all across Appalachia. 
and using giant drills to attack us with super mutants, and they're armed to the teeth, too. If I didn't know better, I'd say you both were batshit crazy. I saw the drill myself, Ward. This is just confirmation for me. And I had a look at that jammer they brought back. I've never seen anything like it. And the power source? I'd swear it's ultrasite. Ultrasite? It's a rare radioactive element. And very dangerous. Dangerous? Then what the hell are you doing bringing that thing in here? It's stable. Barely any detectable radiation from it at all. But the power it's capable of? I think this one little battery could power all of Foundation for a year. Horde, this is serious. Really serious. We need to get in touch with the others. The White Spring, Crater, Vault Town, the Overseer, and whomever else we can. If we don't face this together, it's going to be the end of all of us. Well, ain't you a shining beacon of light? It's the truth, Ward. It don't matter who's a raider or a settler or whatever, if we all end up becoming mutant chow, or worse. Ward sat back in his chair, taking off his old cowboy hat and rubbing his forehead. And here we thought Appalachia could be our new home. It is our home. Isn't that worth fighting for? Okay, okay, pipe down. Y'all don't need to convince me. Foundation is worth fighting for, and you're right. All of those other folks got just as much to lose. Hell, if Amanda and her crew and our settlers can bleed for each other, maybe, just maybe, the rest of us can too. That's the spirit. First, we need to get communications back. We need to get Abby back up to her bunker in the mire. Well, we also convince Rose to give us the uplink that she scrolled away for the past few years. That ain't gonna be easy. Last we heard, top of the world was overrun with super mutants. Didn't say it was going to be easy, but I know a couple old smugglers trails we can use that should get us at least a little closer. I'll take Cindy and my crew. We know the terrain better than anyone. Shouldn't I stay here just in case? I am not letting you out of my sight again, baby doll. Aww, that's sweet. The others around the table chuckled while Amanda stubbornly pretended she wasn't blushing a tiny bit. <clears throat> well, that means Jones will ride shotgun with Abby. Well, I can spare a few guards, but I need everyone else, just in case the super mutants come back. A couple of our mole miner friends want to come too. The other two can stay here. We don't have much time, so I recommend we head out first thing in the morning. I want to take this jammer too. Who knows, maybe it'll come in handy. Yes, please. I don't like the idea of having what could be a small nuclear bomb in my settlement. Ward! Just saying. Eugenie's gonna stay here too, just in case we hear anything from the White Spring. Now, everyone try to get a good night's sleep. We'll leave first thing in the morning. Got it? The group nodded and went their separate ways. Amanda walked into the courtyard and found Cindy waiting for her. Hey, Amanda. Baby doll, you okay? I really missed you. I I was afraid I wasn't going to see you again. Amanda stepped forward and took Cindy in her arms. It almost killed me to let you go. But it was the right thing to do. But I don't plan on letting you out of my sight again, even if it means we have to cut our way through a bunch of super mutants. We'll do it together. (laughs) You say the most romantic things, Amanda. I try, baby doll. You melted this raider's heart, and I'll be damned if I let anything get between you and I ever again. I love you, Amanda. Cindy, I love you too. Come on, we need to make up for lost time. We do need to sleep too, you know. I promise there will be sleeping involved. Eventually. (laughs) Amanda... Cindy couldn't help but laugh as Amanda kissed her and led her by the hand across the courtyard towards their room. As night fell across Appalachia, Foundation stood as a beacon against the chaos engulfing the region. The dawn often brings new challenges, but for those that would take a stand against the rising tide of darkness, it also brings a gift as fragile as it is powerful. Hope.
Sergeant Blaine and the other New Enclave survivors, along with Graham and Charlie, have been following Frederick Rivers through a series of twisting mole miner tunnels for what seemed like forever. Along the way, they had picked up a few mole miners, victims of other pack pacification attacks on their settlements, and they tagged along as they really had no other place to go. Finally, Frederick had stopped in front of what appeared to be a boarded up side tunnel. He placed his hand against the old wood and everyone was surprised when it easily slid open, revealing a long concrete corridor. One of my secret entrances I had built, most before the war, but some like this one, soon after. It wasn't easy, but given what my Shannon was planning, secrecy was our top priority. Shannon was the mistress of mysteries in those old radio shows, right? Those were the best. They used to play them in the vault every Saturday night. Well, until we started the vault poker league. Then they moved to Friday nights. Oh, so that was your fault, Sullivan. Hey, don't blame me that more people wanted to play cards than listen to the same episodes for the hundredth time. Hey, speak for yourself. Those shows were the best. I could still sit and listen to them for hours. <laughs> I believe I could recite all of Shannon's lines by heart. I used to help her practice when I wasn't off working. Me have friend named Maul. He talk about unstoppables all the time. Was fan of mistress, too. Oh, because of course he is. I don't think I'll ever be able to look at super mutants the same way again. Who knows? Maybe we could start the first pan-species poker tournament, right, Bitter? After getting cleaned out by the mole miners, I'm not sure if I'm ready to press my luck with super mutants. Before brothers got sick, was not bad. Some not like humans, but we not all want to fight. There were other like me. Maybe some still are. How close are we, Frederick? We're all beaten and need a rest before we figure out what happened to the colonel, and now we get back to the White Spring. Very close now. This tunnel will lead us right up to our old flower garden. I feel like I'm in one of those old shows now, that's for sure. More than you know, young lady. More than you know. The group proceeded down the corridor until they reached the end with a large hatch. Frederick opened the side panel and frowned. The backup power is out, so we'll have to open this manually, and it's very heavy. I mean, we've got a super mutant. Graham, want to give it a go? No worry. Me like moving heavy things. Graham walked forward and placed his hands on the side of the hatch. He grunted, then strained and then pushed as hard as he could until the metal gave way, and with one final shove, the hatch opened, allowing sunlight to pour into the tunnel, along with a large pile of dirt, weeds, and old flowers. Good job, big guy. Knew you could do it. Me happy too, Sam. Good to smell Appalachia again, and feed Charlie with fresh greens. The survivors shielded their eyes as they climbed out of the tunnel, seeing the sun for the first time in what seemed like weeks. The old garden they had emerged into was covered in waist-high weeds and debris from a collapsed greenhouse, but in front of them, rising four stories tall, was Riverside Manor. Home sweet home. That's something else. Looks like a goddamn castle. Are those cannons on top? <laughs> uh, decorative only, although I... Had considered adding some turrets back in the day, but again, we're trying to keep a low profile. The massive house was mostly intact, with one section that appeared to have been damaged in a fire. As Frederick took in the sights, a tear welled up in his eye. You okay, Frederick? This is only the second time I've been back since, well, since my wife passed away. Part of me longed to forget about this place, but Appalachia keeps bringing me back. I think it's about time I forgave myself for what happened, and make a difference once again. Look, you did what you could. If it wasn't for you, I know I'd be dead, so if nothing else, I'd say you've made a really big difference already. Frederick nodded and slapped Lawson on the back. He sometimes regretted not having more children, but the young man was now the closest thing he had to a family. He led them to a side entrance. They didn't know what to expect, so everyone led with their rifles as they set foot inside. This was an old servant's entrance. We also used it for deliveries after the war. The girls would come and go from here, 
when they were doing their chores. Girls? When the bombs dropped, there was so much chaos. So many refugees and orphans, Shannon ended up adopting many young girls, protecting them, and soon after, they became mistresses of mysteries, too. They were all superheroes? Just heroes, the heroes we thought Appalachia needed. We did as much as we could for as long as we could, but it all came crashing down in the end. Truly, I never believed our daughter would be the one to betray us. It was my wife's one fault, and perhaps my own. We loved her so much that we never saw what she had become until it was too late. Frederick took a deep breath and managed a small smile, before leading them further into the house. The years had not been kind, as the carpet squished under their feet and the walls were covered in mold, but some of the old regal style came through. They found a few dead scorched, all shot, and recently too. Besides these, looks like the rest of the house is clear. Frederick was about to say something about the previous trespassers into the house, but thought better of it. That would be a tale for later, once they had gotten settled. Frederick walked them into the main foyer and pointed to a large painting still hanging between the grand staircases going up to the second floor. May I introduce you to Shannon Rivers, the Mistress of Mysteries. She's something else. A looker for sure. Pretty for human. I don't think we have time for a full tour, Frederick. Uh, Of course. Sorry. Force of habit. I would routinely entertain the guests. Follow me. Frederick led them into the study, lined with bookcases and a player piano in one corner. As the others looked around, Frederick walked over to a weathered globe in the corner and opened it, revealing a set of old liquor bottles and a wooden box. Still here, Sergeant. I was told you appreciated some of the finer things. Come take a look. Hot dog! Is that? The finest scotch and bourbon, plus a box of the finest cigars. Mother Gunner found a Another package years ago, which I believe she gifted to you. She did. Didn't think any of them would still be around. I do appreciate a fine cigar. It appears we have much in common, Sergeant. Hey, Bitter and I wouldn't mind one, too. Me not smoke. Not like smell. That makes two of us, big guy, but I wouldn't mind a drink. Then let us get comfortable. Just a moment. We can't use the normal means of accessing the sanctum, but I always have a backup. Frederick handed the cigars and liquor to Sergeant Blaine, and then walked over to the piano. Sitting down, he cracked his knuckles before playing a short set of notes. The group was startled when part of the opposite wall slid open, revealing a door, and then a set of stairs going down. A secret passage? Oh man, Douglas is going to be so jealous! Follow me, you are about to see something incredible. Walking down the stairs and along another concrete corridor, they all ended up in front of a large metal door, which screeched open on a set of greased hinges. You've got to be kidding me. Oh, okay. Someone pinch me, cuz I must be dreaming. I I can't believe it. It's real. Well, I'll be. Welcome to the sanctum of the Mistress of Mysteries. For years, my wife and our girls use this place to combat the chaos of Appalachia. We have training rooms, medical facilities, a production area, and most importantly... Cryptos, one of the most advanced computers anywhere on the planet. Me wish I had things to trade for this. All of this, hidden under your mansion. How? Money and fame. Between my contracts with the government and what Shannon earned, we have more than anyone can spend in several lifetimes. When they were going to make Mistress of Mysteries a TV show... I surprised my wife by building all of this for her. I had no idea it would become what it did. But now all of this is yours. From here, we will be able to find out more about what is going on and how we can fight against the pact. 
When you describe it to me, I didn't even imagine. Frederick, I don't know what to say. No thanks is necessary, Sergeant. I only wish your colonel was here. Let me get all the systems online and all you can make yourselves at home. You heard the man. Sullivan, Bitter, find a place for us to put our equipment. Samantha, take Graham and see what kind of weapons and supplies you can find. Lawson, take the others and get settled. The group broke up, with people heading in different directions, but all taking in the majesty of the facility. Frederick wasn't overstating it when he said he had recreated the sanctum almost down to its finest detail. The stylized logo of the mistress adorned the wall, looking over everything. It was beyond anything any of them had ever seen in the bunker. And in the middle was a large mainframe computer that Frederick named Cryptos. Blaine walked behind Frederick as he went up to the closest terminal and started typing commands. Slowly the screens came to life and lights came on in each of the rooms, followed by a voice that Blaine immediately recognized as Shannon Rivers, the Mistress of Mysteries. Welcome back, Frederick. It has been a long time. It has. I'm sorry I couldn't come back sooner, Cryptos. We are operating at 85% efficiency. The Sanctum is at your disposal. How can we assist you? Well, what exactly can this thing do, Frederick? Cryptos was tied to an old DIA regional surveillance system. There's a duplicate system in Sugar Grove, one that I built as part of a very lucrative government contract. My system has encrypted hardline access to all the information that the old system collected. It's how I stayed a step ahead of the raiders. And it's still active? Let's see, one moment. Why, yes. We still have access, and it's been collecting data for all of these years. So what does that mean? It means, Sergeant, that once I have cryptos analyze the data, we'll not only be able to find out what's been going on in Appalachia for the last decade, but we can find out what's going on now. And maybe, just maybe, we can find your colonel, and a way to defeat the Pact. And just how long is that going to take? I've already started the process. Cryptos has capabilities that would put Rob Coe to shame. I spared no expense for my Shannon. Sergeant, would you join me for a cigar while we wait? Lawson, as much as he was good company, never could appreciate a fine cigar. Pour me a glass of scotch and hand me one of those cigars. I think we have a lot to talk about. At your service, Sergeant. Let's go down to the studio while we wait. I have a few more things I want to show you. As the sanctum of the Mistress of Mysteries came to life and Cryptos hummed with its data processing routines, Frederick led Sergeant Blaine downstairs into what looked like an inventor's paradise. All sorts of gizmos and doodads littered the office, while several workbenches and a fully functional fabrication machine lined the walls. As the two men lit their cigars and sipped their scotch, Frederick picked up what appeared to be a heavily modified stealth boy. Sergeant, I call this the Phantom Device. It's a very special weapon I made for the mistress. And I have some ideas on how we can use it when the time comes. Thank you again, members, for joining us here on The Modus Files. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe, and better yet, please leave a review to help others find our little enclave. You can also follow us on our various social media accounts, including Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky, at Modus Files, or at Modus Files Podcast, for more information about our story, Fallout 76 content, and random musings on the enclave. We also have a Patreon, if you'd like to support our work and receive special benefits like early access to episodes, original scripts, and special events with our cast. A link to our Patreon can be found at modusfiles.com. I'd also like to thank our cast, Pandora Beatrix as Colonel Valeria Faustina, Rosalind Stein, Weasel, and Hente Warward, Lucy Middleton as Major Lilith Alistair and Amanda, XO one King as Major Andrew Stein, Mandy Marie B as Abigail Singh, Chrissy Williams as Trader Red, the Assaultron, and Shannon Rivers, a.k.a. Cryptos. Chris Smith from One Wall Comedy as Sergeant Blaine, Graham, Maul, and Vinny Costas. Chrissy Williams as Trader Red and Researcher Emily. Maria Cheshire as Lieutenant Cindy. Austin Rogers as Lieutenant Jones. Jessica Starr as Sophia Daguerre. 
Patrick Conway as Frederick Rivers, Christy Harrison as Evelyn Hornwright, Michelle Lia Tan as Chairwoman Xiao Liang, DJ Reed as Maximilian Wolf and the Foundation Guard, Risa Montinez as Esmeralda Marcos, M. Dash as Senator Joseph Stein, Gray Eleven, and the Enclave Corporal, Mark Hosworth as Ward from Foundation and Bitter, Josh Smith as Gray Nine, Aaron McNamara as Dr. Naomi Harefield, Cherry Pixel as Cherry, Rob Cunningham as Private Lawson and the Mole Miners, Tim Young as Sullivan, Cashel and a Corset as Private Samantha, Phobos as the Enclave Private and Raider Number Two, Eric Gold as Gray Commander, Ray O'Hare as the Mr. Handybots, Aaron Atherton as Corporal Jameson, Fives as Raider Number One, Steve Lumberg as Raider Boss Cyrus, Amanda Lee as Violet, and Brad Williams as the voice of Modus, Colonel Reynolds, Sergeant Muller, and Mayor Edwards. As our third season continues, we want to thank our extended cast, crew, and all of our other creators who have helped support the community for the past several years. Without all of you, this wouldn't have been possible. And a very special thank you to Nobody, our very first commissioned artist, who is now working on updated portraits of our main cast. Stay tuned for our next episode, So the Wind. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. God bless the Enclave, and God bless America. Members, we look forward to your next visit to our little Enclave.